Hey, welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show here on Reason and Theology on a Monday. Wow, a lot of fireworks have been going on in the last six hours. A lot of um, things have been taking place this morning. Um, so I am going to cover it all because there's a lot of confusion already. There's a lot of uh, different reports out there, all kinds of misinformation. Um, some people don't have the complete um picture and so what i intend to do is present a complete picture of the controversy that has erupted today which is that uh six cardinals have submitted to dubia to the vatican and released that information today now if you're if you're not familiar with what a dubia is so dubia is plural for dubium um and it means question in latin so these are theological questions that are usually presented by high profile individuals in the church to the pope and or the congregation or now dicastery for the doctrine of the faith and um i certainly can appreciate uh dubia that this is something that when submitted to the uh, Pope or the Vatican to get clarification and precision on a theological question. I love that. I am all about being precise in theology, getting questions answered, being clear and upfront on things. So I, I love Dubia. Uh, <laughs> um, that, that being said, we're going to analyze the two Dubia that were submitted by these six cardinals to the Vatican, as well as the Vatican's response to the first Dubia. The second Dubia has not received a response yet. But before we can dive into that, I can't tell you how crucial this is. I have to go over a timeline of things that have just transpired in the last six hours. Yes, a timeline of effectively just this morning, although I'll talk about some things prior to that as well. I have to do that because if you don't see this timeline in progress chronologically, you're going to get very confused because there's a lot of moving pieces. Fortunately for you, I have done that work. I've done the footwork for you. I'm going to give you a timeline and I'm going to make this very easy on you when it comes to the questions that were submitted to the Vatican and the responses, because unfortunately, you're not going to see them in one particular document. You're not going to see it nicely structured. I've done that for you so that you don't have to jump around and read all these various documents and go back and click over here. I've done that for you. So I'm going to make that very, very um, clear for you. Let me first, however, start with the timeline. I'm going to share my screen uh, so that we can see this visually. This is a timeline that I've put together this morning, again, due to the fact that just so much has been going on here. And there's already confusion. And I can tell you this is going to be something that people are going to be confused about for years to come unless it is addressed immediately, which is why I'm addressing it right now. Okay, so the first dubia, that's going to be the set of questions that was presented to the Pope. The first dubia was privately. Now, notice I'm saying the word privately. This was privately submitted to the Pope on July 10th, 2023. So this year by several cardinals, including Cardinal Burke and Bram Mueller and Sarah, and also Zen, whom I've interviewed. Okay, now, it was privately submitted July 10th, so we're going to call it the July dubia. Now, Francis personally, Pope Francis personally responds to this July 10 dubia the very next day, July 11th. I mean, talk about prompt. I mean, he immediately and personally responded. Now, I imagine he probably had a ghost writer. Um, no, that is speculation on my part. Um, but I imagine he had some help, had a ghost writer, and then he signs it by name, which he did sign it by name. Okay, so he responds immediately, however, privately and personally to the Cardinals, because they submitted it to him privately. They did not make it public. So he responds to them privately. And this is actually pretty common when it comes to dubia submissions. A lot of these things tend to be private. Every now and then some of them get published publicly, and you'll find that on the Dicastery's website. Uh, but a lot of times they don't get published publicly. They're just private correspondences. Okay. And so it's a very healthy process where a theologian or a cardinal or a priest or somebody 
can ask a question and get a response from the Vatican. It's a wonderful thing. Okay. So Pope Francis responds to the July one the very next day. Now, the cardinals privately submitted a second dubia in, on August 21st. So we can now call it the August dubia. After they received the reply from Pope Francis to their July dubia, they submitted it because they were unsatisfied with it. They did not like the answers they got in there because the answers were very long, as we will see, and they wanted a simple yes or no. They didn't want these long answers, and they felt that the long answers did not specifically answer their questions. For those two reasons, they submit a second one, August 21st. This was done privately, and they ask simple yes or no to the questions. Now, there is a problem with this simple yes or no. As you know in theology, or at least I hope you know in theology, some things are a simple yes and no. Absolutely. But in fact, in many areas of theology, there isn't a simple yes and no. That is a fact. Let me give you an example. Was the Son of Man ignorant of his second coming? Yes or no? Well, if you've ever read Matthew 24, 36, you know there's a sense in which you can say yes. There's also a sense in which you could say absolutely not because he's omniscient, right? He's the second person of the Trinity. But Matthew 24, 36 says he is ignorant of his second coming. That is Jesus. And yet we know he's not. So there's a sense in which you can answer yes and also a sense in which you can say no emphatically. But if you just answer a yes or no to that question, that's not good enough. You're going to have to give more than either a yes or a no, because either way you answer that thing, you're going to have difficulties. So you have to give more than a yes or no. That is one of the problems with, hey, answer my theological question, yes or no. Excuse me, some matters of theology require more than a yes or no answer. Okay, well, let's move on beyond that. The, the, the situation develops because on September 25th, Archbishop Fernandez, now Cardinal Fernandez. I need to get in the habit of he's just made a cardinal. Cardinal Fernandez, who was just recently appointed over the head of the Dicastery of the Doctrine of the Faith, the chief, the doctrine chief, if you will. Fernandez privately, again privately, wrote to the Pope on September 25th and asked, Pope Francis, can I publish your response to the July dubia? He asks that September 25th, all right? Now, today, October 2nd, Cardinal Burke and these cardinals, but especially on Cardinal Burke's website, publicly releases both the first and second dubia. So the July dubia and the August dubia, he releases both of them today. So today is the first anybody has heard of this publicly. October 2nd, today. You'll see why I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting this. Now, Catholic News, um, or CNA, I should say, publicly reports about the two dubia today, also on October 2nd. So they do, the day that this was submitted by Cardinal Burke, or published, I should say, CNA publicly reports about the event and about the issue. You'll see why it matters in a moment. Cardinal Burke, however, does not initially post Pope Francis's response to the first dubia, the July response. The second dubia, however, the August dubia, does include incomplete responses from Pope Francis, but not his full response. So just Back up here and think about what's taking place. Burke posts both dubia, the July and August dubia, but does not, does not post the response to the July dubia. However, in the August dubia, he's critiquing Pope Francis's initial response, but doesn't show us the full response. So CNA asks him in the article today, can we see that response of Pope Francis? And here's the response. The cardinals declined the register's request to review the Pope's July 11th response 
as they say the response was addressed only to them and so not meant for the public. All right. So initially, earlier today, the story was Burke and these cardinals did not present and publish the Pope's response, even though they are critiquing it and even though they are giving a few snippets of it here and there, but very an in incomplete picture of it. They're doing that in the second dubia, but they're not posting the complete response. And the answer was, well, it was privately for us. Now, they don't use the same logic and say, but their dubia was privately submitted to the Pope. No, they post that publicly. And we'll see why lately or a little bit later on. And I'll address that. However, however, fortunately, today, after the cardinals posted the two dubia but did not post pope francis's full response the vatican posts on its website in italian the full response of the july dubia since the cardinals refused to do so so they are johnny on the spot the vatican johnny on the spot before this thing got out of hand the very morning that the Cardinals break news, promote their side of the story, don't tell you what the Vatican said in any complete form. The Vatican is Johnny on the spot. They released this because remember, back in September, Fernandez had already asked Pope Francis for permission to publicly respond to this. So they were expecting the Cardinals to do this. So once the Cardinals posted this, bam, Johnny on the spot, the Vatican posts the full dubia response that pope francis released so that we can get a full presentation in the entire picture what the cardinals had given us was an incomplete picture however the vatican ensured that we would get the full picture so they just posted that but the plot thickens and by the way since it was in italian where peter is posted a translation of the Vatican response in English earlier this morning, right after the Vatican posted that. They they are also, Johnny on the spot, got a translation of it immediately and posted it. Now, here's, here's what's even more interesting. So originally, the Cardinals were saying, as of earlier today, they're not posting the response of Pope Francis because it was privately submitted. Vatican comes out, bam, Johnny on the spot gives you the full response of Pope Francis. So now on Cardinal Burke's page, they updated it after the Vatican did this. And now they're giving you the full response of Pope Francis, but they're only doing that after the Vatican had done so. And I'm going to prove it to you. Not only do I know this factually, I'm going to prove it to you. Number one, if you look at Cardinal Burke's website, that presents the first dubia, the July dubia. You should be able to see it on your screen now. There's the July dubia. Now here's Francis's response. This was not there earlier today until the Vatican released the response. Then they added this. And here's the second dubia, the August dubia. This entire section wasn't there earlier until the Vatican came out. So in other words, according to the Cardinals themselves, they were going to leave us in the dark. They weren't going to give this to us because it was personally released to just them. It was private to just them, they say. But now they put it on the website after the Vatican puts it out. But only after the Vatican puts it out. Earlier, this wasn't there. You can see a remnant of that in the fact that it says two enclosures when in fact there's still there's actually three here three enclosures. And then number two, I'll give you a screenshot of what the website looked like earlier today. This is what the website looked like earlier today. Cardinal Burke's website. First dubia, July dubia, and then August dubia. Guess what's missing? Pope Francis's response. Because according to the Cardinals, they were going to leave us in the dark because it was a private response. They're only now giving that on the website because the Vatican came out and publicly posted it because the Cardinals gave a very incomplete version of Pope Francis's response. Make of that whatever you will. 
Now, let me uh, pull this back up here. Uh, sorry, actually lost my presentation. Let me get back to it. Um, and let's continue with it. Okay. Let me share my screen once more. Should be able to see it now. Okay. So now what I'm going to show you is I put everything side by side all together so that you don't have to. What I'm about to show you is the original July Dubia questions, which comes from Cardinal Burke's website. Then I'm going to show you what the Cardinals were giving us when they left us in the dark, an incomplete presentation of what Francis said to the July Dubia. I'm going to show you what they gave to us when they were leaving us in the dark, and then I'm going to show you what Pope Francis actually said in its entire form, which comes from the Vatican website translated in English by where Peter is. So I'm going to show you three different sources, but instead of jumping around all on the screen, I'm going to show you all in one place um, this, this information so that you can follow it and you can get the full picture. Now, this is what September on September 25th, what Fernandez sent to the Holy Father asking for this to be made available publicly. He says, and this came out today again. Having received from you a copy of your letter July 11th, 2023, in which you respond to five dubia of Cardinal Burke's and Bram, uh, Cardinal, Cardinals Burke and Bram Mueller, I ask your authorization so that the, the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith may take into consideration and possibly quote some of some paragraphs of these responses in order to better clarify the, qu uh, the question submitted to you. So he asks, hey, can I get permission to post this thing or at the very least post some quotes from it? Okay, Pope Francis gave the green light because it is today on the website after the Cardinals failed to present it themselves and only gave it gave a skewed and distorted, I might add, um, presentation of what Pope Francis said, as we will see here in a moment. Now, I don't know what their intentions were. I'm not trying to uh, let me make this very clear. I'm not trying to read hearts. I don't know what Cardinal Burke's intentions or Bram Mueller or any of, for all I know, this was just really, really bad management. And there's no ill will here. There's no intention to deceive. There's no intention to mislead the faithful. There's no intention to distort Pope Francis. For all I know, the intentions are good. They just have misunderstood the situation and really poorly managed this issue publicly in the mass media. For all I know, that's the case. So let me make this very clear. I don't know what their intentions are. I'm not questioning intentions. I'm just presenting to you the facts, and they can speak for themselves on what their intentions are. Cardinal um, Bram Mueller, um, Burke, they can come out and explain their intentions themselves, and I'll take them at their word. I'm just going to present facts to you, what they say Pope Francis said, what he actually said, and leave it at that. Now, let's uh, let's go to, again, the presentation that I have for you all here that gives you the complete picture. Let's see here. Mm, there we go. OK. All right. So Pope Francis responds to them privately with this preface. So this is part of his July response, right? The July 11th response to the July 10th dubia. This is Pope Francis. To the Cardinals, dear brothers, uh, while I do not always find it prudent, uh, while, while I do not always find it prudent to answer questions addressed directly to me, and it would be impossible to answer them all, in this case, I thought it appropriate to do so because of the proximity of the synod. Okay, fair enough. So he gives a response to them, but I'm going to put in the questions first so that you have a good point of reference. Here's what it, what what the question is before we get to his response. Here, here are the Cardinals question number one uh, from Burke's website. Number one, dubium, about the claim that we should reinterpret divine revelation according to cultural and anthropological changes in vogue. After the statements of some bishops, which have been neither corrected nor retracted, it is asked whether in the church divine revelation should be in, reinterpreted according to the cultural changes of our time and according to the new anthropological vision that these changes promote. Whether divine re revelation is binding forever 
immutable, and therefore not to be contradicted, according to the dictum of the Second Vatican Council that the God who reveals is do the obedience of faith, that's Dave Urban 5, that what is revealed for the salvation of all must remain in their entirety throughout the ages and alive and be transmitted to all generations, and that the progress of understanding does not imply any change in the truth of things and words because faith has been handed on once and for all, and the magisterium is not superior to the word of God, but teaches only what has been handed down. That's day verbum 10, right? Good question. Although I will say it's unnecessary since it has already been answered. And Pope Francis has been clear enough about this if you read them elsewhere. But hey, there's nothing wrong with them asking for further clarification um, or confirmation of this, even though he has already been clear elsewhere. And it is true in some cases, some people haven't been corrected. So I'm in agreement with the uh, cardinals and saying, you know, Maybe some of that should be corrected. That's kind of implied there in the question, right? I certainly think that it should. Um, now, here's what the Cardinals gave us as what Pope Francis said in response to question one. It's an incomplete portrayal of Francis's response. You can find this at CNA, and they themselves are quoting from the second dubia, August, the August dubia. So they're going to give you an incomplete response of pope francis but they again according to them they weren't going to give us the full thing we only know the full thing because the vatican gave it to us but here's how they presented pope francis as responding to that question and then we're going to see how he actually responded the cardinals said the pope responded july 11 by saying that the church can deepen her understanding of the deposit of faith which they agreed with but that the response did not capture our concern so they're giving the impression that that's all Pope Francis said. He's just saying, look, hey, we can deepen our understanding of the deposit of faith. And he just completely sidesteps the question. And if the Vatican had not given us the full picture, every one of us right now on social media would be posting on social media. Look how Pope Francis sidestepped the question. He didn't really answer it. Look what he's doing here. We would have an incomplete and distorted understanding from what the Cardinals gave us. Fortunately, the Vatican actually released the full response because they anticipated it would seem that they would post their two dubia. Um, now, Francis's actual response to question one from the Vatican website as translated by where Peter is. Pope Francis says the answer depends on the meaning you give to the word reinterpret. If it is understood as to interpret better, the, the expression is valid. In this sense, the Second Vatican Council affirms that it is necessary that with the work of exegetes, I would add of theologians, the church's judgment should mature. And now you have Vatican II, Dogmatic Constitution, De Verbum 12. And it's not just unique to Vatican II, what Pope Francis is saying there. That is that is preconciliar, by the way. Uh, so this is rock solid. We, we, we have to absolutely agree. Sure. Of course, you can always have a better understanding, and the church does have a better understanding of the faith. It doesn't contradict the faith, but has a better understanding. This is part of the development of doctrine over time. Many magisterial documents speak of this phenomenon, so this is not unique to Vatican II or Pope Francis. He continues, therefore, while it is true that divine revelation is immutable, that means it's unchanging. So did you hear that? For everyone out there who thinks that Pope Francis believes dogma can change, Pope Francis just told you, no, he does not believe that. So if you continue to say that, you bear false witness, although Pope Francis has already made this clear elsewhere. He says, while it's true that divine revelation is immutable and always binding, so it's binding on your conscience, the church must be humble and recognize that she never exhausts its unfathomable unfathomable riches and needs to grow in her understanding. Again, this is something that we see um, Mysterium Ecclesia, uh, I'm pretty sure, is one of the documents that talks about this. The church is constantly growing in its understanding of the deposit of faith. Again, this is part of the development of doctrine. This is part of uh, Catholic, the Catholic magisterium and how we understand that. So, um, so far, so good. Nothing, nothing wrong with what Pope Francis is saying here. That's well established. Uh, 
Consequently, she also matures in her understanding of what she herself has affirmed in her magisterium. So she matures. She doesn't contradict the, the positive faith, but she does mature in her understanding of what she herself has affirmed in her magisterium. Think about the development that we have in the veneration of icons and images from the first century unto the Council of Nicaea II. Just think of that 700 year period, how we did have a development in our understanding of the Christian relation to images and especially the veneration of them. Not a contradiction, not contradicting the positive faith, but rather a development in its understanding. He continues, cultural changes and the new challenges of history do not modify revelation. So anybody who's saying, and I have seen some German bishops saying that they're corrected by Pope Francis right here, that the somehow the zeitgeist or what the culture is saying changes what divine revelation is. Absolutely not. It's immutable. However, the culture can stimulate us to make more explicit some aspects of its overflowing richness, which always offers more, which is exactly what happened with the Counter-Reformation. The Council of Trent is a product of Protestants critiquing us and us diving deeper into the deposited faith and further clarifying ourselves. So you can thank the Council of Trent and the clarity that it brought um, to us and to the faithful. You, you, can, you can thank them because they're responding to things that were going on in the culture. And they were saying, yeah, some points that are being made here are legitimate points. And the Counter-Reformation adopted those good things and then also got rid of anything bad in the culture. That's the Council of Trent. So we see this over and over in church history. He says, it's inevitable that this can lead to a better expression of some past statements of the magisterium. And in fact, this has been the case throughout history. By the way, this is still all question one that he's responding to. Now, again, notice how they literally just gave us one, one little snippet of what Pope Francis said. They gave us one picture, but now we're reading something very different when we read the full response. And then he continues. On the other hand, it is true that the magisterium is not superior to the word of God, but it is also true that both the text of scripture and the testimonies of tradition, and notice it's capitalized there, need an interpretation that makes it possible to distinguish between the perennial substance from cultural conditioning. This is something you see over and over in the magisterium. I talk about this, in fact, in my dissertation, what is called a filtering. Um, you can find this in multiple mag magisterial documents where it says the magisterium and what it teaches and the substance of what it teaches is one thing. Some of the cultural conditions in which it finds itself in its, ex in its expression is another. And over the period of time, you might have some filtering with some of those cultural conditions. And then you get to the substance of what was actually being asserted by the magisterium, the substance of the faith. So whoever wrote this, and I suspect it was Fernandez and Pope Francis is signing off on it. Whoever wrote this knows their stuff. They know the magisterium very well because this is actually building on multiple other magisterial documents that make this point very clear. It is, it is evident, for example, in the biblical text, such as Exodus 21 and in certain magisterial interventions that tolerated slavery, and he quotes Nicholas V or references Nicholas V. This is not a minor issue given its intimate connection with the perennial truth of the inalienable dignity of the human person. These texts are in need of interpretation, right? We're, we're not Protestants, right? The magisterium is what interprets the magisterium. You don't get to do that privately over and against the magisterium's interpretation of the magisterium. Martin Luther says, no, I get to interpret the magisterium and the deposit of faith. The magisterium says, no, the authentic teachers, that is the Pope and the bishops in communion with him as the College of Bishops, the magisterium is the, the interpreter of those things. And your interpretation can't be in violation of the authentic magisterium's interpretation. The same is true for some New Testament considerations on women and for other cultural, uh, other texts of scripture and testimonies of tradition that today cannot be materially repeated. And I think that what they're referring to here is like a woman can't talk in church, 
you know, Paul talks about how a woman cannot speak in church. Yeah, obviously there's there's some cultural things going on there that doesn't necessarily apply to today. He continues, still all part of the first question. It is important to emphasize that what cannot change is what has been revealed for the salvation of all. So that's the deposit of faith. That's what Vatican II is talking about. For this reason, the church must constantly discern between what is essential for salvation and what is secondary or less directly connected with this goal. In this regard, I would like to recall what Aquinas said. The more one descends into particulars, the more indeterminacy increases. Finally, a single formulation of a truth can never be adequately understood if it is presented in isolation, isolated from the rich and harmonious context of the whole of Revelation. We know that's true. All of the Christological debates in the first millennium were because people were isolating some truths. Jesus is fully God, yes. But if you isolate that from the fact that he's also fully divine, I'm sorry, uh, fully human, now we have a problem. Or some people would isolate, he's fully human, but he's not necessarily fully divine. Or he's a combination of the two. And then you start to get into other theological areas because he's not a combination. He's fully God, fully man, and one person. And so you have to take the entirety of Revelation and you can't isolate some things in Revelation and then avoid others. That's what he's saying. The hierarchy of truths, which means that we have some teachings that build on other teachings, like the doctrine of purgatory builds on a lot of other doctrines prior to that. So that if you don't have those doctrines established first, you won't understand purgatory. That's what the hierarchy of truths refers to. The hierarchy of truths also implies situating each of them in adequate connection with the more central truths and with the totality of the church's teachings. So there are some things that have more centrality to them than other doctrines, like indulgences. Another example, you can't understand indulgences without understanding a whole avalanche of other doctrines first that are more central than the doctrine of indulgences itself. This can finally give rise to different ways of expounding the same doctrine even though to those who are satisfied with a monolithic doctrine defended by all without nuance, this may seem an imperfect dispersion. So in other words, we need to be nuanced and we need to take the entirety of doctrine in Revelation and not isolate some things from, to the exclusion of others. Because guess what? That is how every single heresy in the history of the church has been established. Because somebody takes some truth and they isolate it from other things that are true from other parts of divine revelation. That's how you create a heresy. So to avoid creating another heresy, we have to make sure we're taking all of divine truth and not in isolation, but together and keeping things in perspective. But the reality is that this variety helps to better manifest and develop the various aspects of the inexhaustible richness of the gospel. Each theological line has its risks, but also its opportunities. Now, Think of that response that you just got compared to all the cardinals gave us. And if the Vatican had not come out and given us the full response, we would all be on Twitter and social media bashing the Pope right now. How dare he? Can you believe what he said here? And that's all he said? If we were just left in the dark, can you imagine what would be taking place right now? There would be a lot more confusion than there already is. Fortunately, Vatican was Johnny on the spot, immediately gave us the full context of what Pope Francis said. Now, question number two. This is from the Cardinals from the July Dubia, found on Burke's website. Cardinal Burke presents it as following, or as follows. The second dubium about the claim that the widespread practice of the blessing of same-sex unions would be in accord with revelation in the magisterium. According to divine revelation confirmed in sacred scripture, with which the church at the divine command with the help of the Holy Spirit listens to um, devotedly, guards it and with dedication and expounds it faithfully. In the beginning, God created man in his own image, male and female. He created them and blessed them that they might be fruitful, whereby the apostle teaches, Paul teaches that to deny sexual difference is, to, is the consequence of the denial of the creator. It is asked, can the church derogate from this principle 
considering it contrary to what Veritatis Splendor 103 taught as a mere ideal and accepting as a possible good objectively sinful situations such as same-sex unions without betrayal revealed uh, without betraying revealed doctrine well this has already been answered by Pope Francis it's already been responded to and the obvious answer has been no you can't deny revealed doctrine and you can't bless sin Pope Francis in his magisterium in 2021 already said God and the church can't bless sin so it's already been answered but for some reason, they want to ask it again. Perhaps they're saying because other people are putting it into doubt. Sure. But rather than pointing them to what Pope Francis has already said in response to this, instead they're putting it forward to Pope Francis himself as if he hasn't already responded to this. Well, he certainly has. Now, here's how the cardinals, in a very incomplete way, portrayed Pope Francis's response to this second question. And then I'm going to give you the real answer, the complete answer. The Pope responded July 11th. The Cardinal said by saying that equating marriage to blessing same-sex couples would give rise to confusion and so should be avoided. But the Cardinal said that their concern is different, namely that the blessing of same-sex couples might create confusion in any case, not only in that it might take make them uh, seem analogous to marriage, but also and that homosexual acts would be presented practically as a good, or at least as the possible good that God asks of people in their journey towards them. That's it. That's all we had. That's all we got. Now we're going to get a very long response from Pope Francis. And it's already in light of his 2021 magisterial decision that you cannot bless sin. So whatever we're about to read, it's building on what Pope Francis has already said. So it was already answered. That's how they presented the response. Here's what he actually says. According to the Vatican website, Pope Francis says, The church has a very clear conception of marriage. An exclusive, stable, indissoluble union between a man and a woman naturally open to begetting of children. Only this union is called marriage. Other forms of union are realized only in a partial and analogous way, which is why they cannot strictly be called marriage. It is not a mere question of names, but the reality that we call marriage has a unique essential constitution that demands an exclusive name, not applicable to other realities. It is undoubtedly much more than a mere ideal. So he's saying, no, it's not just an ideal. He's explicitly answering them there. For this reason, the church avoids any kind of right or sacramental that could contradict this conviction. So any kind of rite or sacramental that would contradict or undermine the conviction that we have between the man and the, one man and one woman, the church avoids any of these things. And he says that for this reason, the church avoids any kind of rite or sacramental that could contradict this conviction and give the impression that something is not marriage, that is not marriage, is recognized as marriage. In dealing with people, however, pastoral charity, which must permeate all our decisions and attitudes, must not be lost. Of course, we need to be charitable and pastoral to people, of course. The defense of objective truth is not the only expression of this charity, which is also made up of kindness, patience, understanding, tenderness, and encouragement. In other words, yes, we defend the truth, but that's not the only thing that we do as pastors. We're also to be kind, patient, understanding, tender, merciful, because that's what God does with us when he deals with our sin. Whenever we come to confession and we confess the same sin that we've been struggling with for years, God doesn't say, no, I'm not going to forgive you. He's merciful. He's kind. He's patient. And for that reason, so too should the pastors be. Therefore, we cannot become judges who only deny reject, and exclude. Well said. He continues, for this reason, pastoral prudence must adequately discern whether there are forms of blessing requested by one or more persons that do not transmit a mistaken conception of marriage, to which I would say in response to Pope Francis, though that's true, that is not the only concern. 
with all due respect, your holiness. I think another concern is not only that we don't mistake some union as what we find in marriage. That's not the only concern. The other concern is blessing sin, which His Holiness has already said we can't do in 2021. But what I'm saying is that needs to be highlighted. That needs to be reiterated because the this is not the only issue. Blurring the lines with what is marriage, that's one issue, but it's not the only issue. The other issue is saying, you know, people who will say, yes, this isn't a marriage. This, um, uh, th this same-sex union isn't a marriage, but it's still good, and therefore the union itself can be blessed. No. No, the union itself cannot be blessed because the union itself is still disordered. And so whatever good you might still find there, there's things in there that are still disordered so that you can never bless it without then blessing sin. And this is where I think his holiness could have done better in the response he gave to the cardinals with all due respect to his holiness. I think he could do better to help reassure people who are focused on that aspect of this question. Because they're constantly presenting it as people are just focused on, well, people are saying that this is a marriage. Yeah, some people are saying that. And yeah, it's right to respond and say, no, it's not a marriage. And you can't say it's a marriage. But that's not the only concern. And that's not the only thing that people are doing. Some people say, yeah, it isn't a marriage, but we could still bless the union. And so I think more could have been done here, even though Pope Francis has already signed off in his magisterium against blessing same-sex unions in 2021. I think he should have highlighted that more, and that would have helped alleviate some of the concerns that people have. He continues, though. He's not done. He continues. Because when a blessing is requested, one is expressing a request for help from God, a plea to be able to live better, a trust in a father who can help us live better. That's true of people who are of goodwill. People who are of goodwill when they're requesting a blessing, they are requesting, I need help from God because I know I'm not living right. That's true of people who are sincere and of goodwill. The problem, however, is there are people who are not of goodwill and they have an agenda. And the reason why they're asking for their same-sex union to be blessed is not because they're trying to live a holier life and get away from this same-sex union and not because they're trying to get away from sin. The reason why they're asking for it to be blessed is because they want the church to say it is not a sin anymore. They want the church to bless their sin and to make their conscience feel better and to make them feel like, hey, I don't have to worry. I'm not at odds with God in this behavior. They're looking to have their conscience alleviated through the church blessing sin. And so some people don't have good will. They, they are deliberately trying to use the church to make them feel better, to ease their conscience. And that simply can't be done, as Pope Francis and others have already noted. But what I'm saying is, I think Pope Francis should have addressed should have addressed that aspect, because that one needs to be shouted from the rooftops. Because until we shout it from the rooftops, people are going to still just try to capitalize on the fact that the focus tends to be on what is a marriage and what is not. But he continues, on the other hand, although there are situations that, that from the objective point of view are not morally acceptable. Okay, so he's saying the situation, not morally acceptable. Pastoral charity itself requires us not, to not treat as sinners. In other words, people to be shunned. Other people whose guilt or responsibility may be attenuated by various factors that influence subjective uh, imputability. And we do know, and, and they mentioned John Paul II there, and we do know that there are mitigating factors. We all recognize that, but the point, however, is we still can't bless something that is intrinsically disordered, and that just needs to be highlighted more. This is the one response that Pope Francis asks among all, or answers among all the responses that I think could have been better. He continues, decisions which in certain circumstances can form 
part of a pastoral prudence should not necessarily become a norm. So something that you might have from a pastoral situation, you can't impose that as a norm. It's not there, it's not a one size fits all. You know, something that might be a mitigating factor for one person isn't going to be a mitigating factor for someone else due to their circumstances, due to their level of knowledge. That is to say, it is not appropriate for a diocese, a bishop's conference, or any other ecclesial structure to constantly and in an official way enable procedures or rights for all kinds of matters. D do you see what he's saying right there? That's a shot at the German bishops. Because what, what he's saying right there is what the German bishops are doing is wrong. And any other bishops conference that does this is wrong. Since everything, that which is part of a practical discernment in a particular situation, cannot be elevated to the category of the norm. And yet, haven't the German bishops done that? But of course, that's not the only problem with the German bishops, which is what I would say with all due respect to his holiness. Yes, that's a problem. But also, there are no mitigating circumstances that would allow for you to bless a same-sex union you might have mitigating factors that would reduce the individual's level of culpability, but that is a very different issue than blessing the union itself. They're not the same thing. He continues, because this would give rise to an unbearable casuistry. Canon law should not and cannot cover everything, nor should the Episcopal conferences claim to do so with their various documents and protocols, because the life of the church runs through many channels in addition to the normative ones. Sure, I agree. But what I think he should have done is repeated his 2021 decision that you cannot bless in. Because, yeah, sure, canon law can't encompass, encompass everything. Neither can decisions of an Episcopal conference, but the decision that Pope Francis gave in 2021 in his magisterium can certainly go a long way in putting to rest concerns that people have by reiterating that, by highlighting that. Okay, so now what we're going to do, we're, we're going to move on to um, the third question from the Cardinals. So again, this is Original July dubia or dubium. I'm sorry, dubia is, is the plural. Um, and here is going to be the third dubium, the third question of that July dubia, according to Cardinal Burke's website. So uh, the third dubium about the assertion that synodality is a constitutive element of the church so that the church would, by its very nature, be synodal. Um, I mean, with with all due respect, um, the College of Bishops is by nature synodal. Now, that is different from the Synod on Synodality, however. I will, in fairness, point that out. But with all due respect, the Church is, by its constitution, synodal in its Episcopal form. The College of Bishops is, by definition, synodal. Um, but yes, that is that is a little different than the Synod on Synodality, because as we know, the Synod on Synodality is not an expression of the College of Bishops. Um, rather, it is, uh, you know, some advisors who are bishops, some are priests, some are monks, some are laymen, you know. So they're asking, given that the Synod of Bishops does not represent the College of Bishops, which I agree it does not, but is merely a consultative organ of the Pope. Haven't I been saying that? Canon 343, I've been saying that over and over and over. And Pope Francis reconfirmed that, by the way, not long ago, when he updated the Code of Canon Law. So he says, any decision of a synod is not magisterial unless the Pope makes it magisterial. Because it's not an expression of the College of Bishops. I've been saying over and over, it's a consultative body alone. It's not an actual synod. It's not an actual council. It's not an organ of the magisterium. I've been saying it until I'm blue in the face and people just ignore that. And it's right there in canon law. Thank you. Thank you, Cardinals, for repeating that. I'm, I'm glad we made that clear. And people need to take note of that. Listen, the Cardinals are even admitting that. They're telling you the synod of bishops it's not a magisterial organ. It's a consultative body only. It's a consultative organ of the Pope since the bishops, as witnesses of the faith, cannot delegate their con confession of the truth. It is asked whether synodality 
can be the supreme regulator, regulate, regulative criterion of the permanent government of the church without distorting her constitutive order willed by her founder, whereby the supreme and full authority of the church is exercised both by the Pope, by virtue of his office, and by the College of Bishops, together with its head, the Roman Pontiff. It's a legitimate question, although I think it's already been answered, so it was unnecessary. It's a good question. If somebody were to ask me, hey, is the Senate of Bishops like the, the ultimate expression of the magisterium? No. The answer is no. But that's already clear. And there's nothing that Pope Francis has said that has made that unclear. So number three, question number three, is still itself unnecessary. So, so far, these questions that are being asked are unnecessary because the answers have already been given. And so instead of writing a whole document for the entire faithful, you know, the Cardinal's writing a document saying, hey, these questions have already been answered. Look where Pope Francis has answered this and reassuring people. Instead, unfortunately, the Cardinals are putting doubt into the minds of people by asking these questions to Pope Francis when Pope Francis has already answered them. So rather than reassuring people, all this is going to function um, all this will do in reality, in its function, is serve to undermine what Pope Francis has already said and put it into doubt and put it into question, especially when they aren't providing to us initially what the Vatican was actually saying in response, what Pope Francis said in response. This would have been a recipe for disaster if the Vatican had not given us the Pope's side of the story. And this would have been exploited for years to come, like the original dubia that burke among others submitted in 2016 we would have never heard the end of this if the pope had not come out and the vatican had not come out and given us the other side of the story okay well here's how they portrayed pope francis as responding and then i will give you the full response of pope francis which paints a different picture Here's the Cardinal's incomplete portrayal of Pope Francis's response to question three available at CNA and also in the uh, Burke's website in the August uh, dubium or dubia. The Cardinal said Pope Francis responded by assisting, insisting on synodal dimension of the church that includes all the lay faithful. But the Cardinal said they are concerned that synodality is being presented as if it represents the supreme authority of the church in communion with the Pope. That's it. So they're just saying the Pope is saying that the synodal dimension of the church includes the lay faithful. That's it. That's all Pope Francis says. Huh. Well, we actually get a very different understanding when we look at what Pope Francis actually said. Francis's actual answer to question three from the Vatican website. Although you recognize that the supreme and full authority of the church is exercised either by the Pope because of his office or by the College of Bishops together with its, with its head, the Pope. Nevertheless, these dubia, you yourselves manifest your need to participate, to give your opinion freely and to collaborate. And thus you are claiming some form of synodality in the exercise of, of, of my ministry. That is the most mic drop moment I have ever seen from any pulp that I could think of. That's the most mic drop moment. He's saying, yes, of course, the magisterium is going to be the pope and the college of bishops in communion with him. That's not in dispute. So already the question was unnecessary. It was already clear. He was reassuring them that's not in dispute. The Synod on Synodality doesn't replace that. So for the papal posse to have spent so many months now telling us otherwise, I hope they correct themselves now that the Pope has explicitly answered that, even though he already has it elsewhere. I hope they now correct themselves because he's saying no. The Synod on Synodality isn't changing the constitution of the church, as again the papal posse and others have presented the Synod as. But the most mic drop moment here is that he says, but you yourselves, you cardinals yourselves, are doing synodality here by sending me these questions. 
because you yourselves are admitting that you want to participate, give your opinion freely, and collaborate with me in the exercise of my ministry. That's what you're doing in sending me the dubia. So you yourselves, he's telling the cardinals, already manifest the whole purpose of the synod on synodality, which is for what? For people not only to advise the Pope, but also to express their concerns and their opinions. And then the Pope will hear them, and he will teach. It's good for a teacher to hear responses from people, hear what their objections are, hear what their concerns are, and then to teach. And the Pope is saying, that's what you cardinals are doing in sending me this dubia. You yourselves are participating in syn synodality by doing this. That's the most mic drop moment I've ever seen from Pope Francis. Because it's true. They're participating in synodality by doing this. So by even submitting this, they're showing the whole purpose of having the synod of bishops and having a synod on synodality. They're proving that it's needed. You have concerns? You want to express them to me? And you want me to clarify? Congratulations, you're now part of this synodality. <laughs> this whole concept. You're part of it. So now you're seeing the need for it. He continues. The church is mystery of missionary communion. But this communion is not only effective or ethereal, but necessarily implies real participation. That not only the hierarchy, but all the people of God in different ways and at different levels can make their voices heard and feel part of the church's journey. There's nothing wrong with the faithful and everyone from all walks of life in the church to express their concerns, to say, here's some of my concerns. You know what? Pope Francis needs to hear some of the concerns of the faithful that they have about traditionis custodis, right? We would all agree, right? They need to hear some of the concerns. For those who might feel traditionis custodis was overly harsh or not the best approach, the Pope needs to hear that, and he's welcoming responses. In this sense, we can say that synodality as a style and dynamism is an essential dimension of the life of the church. On this point, St. John Paul II has said very beautiful things in his document, Novo Millennio uh, Innuente. It is quite another thing to sacralize or impose a particular synodal methodology that pleases one group to make it the norm and obli obligatory channel for all, because this would only lead to freezing the synodal journey, in the synodal journey ignoring the diverse characteristics of the uh, different particular churches and the varied richness of the universal church. Okay, so he directly answers their question and then explains to them why we have the Synod of Bishops. And isn't that a far cry and a very different picture than what the Cardinals originally gave to us? If the Vatican had not preemptively addressed this situation on the day that the controversy erupted, because make no mistake about it, the controversy erupted this morning and the Vatican was Johnny on the spot. As soon as it erupted, within hours, it was up on the Vatican website. They put an end to it. But if they had not done that, could you imagine how much chaos there would be right now if all we had to go based on was what the Cardinals said and what CNA reported, among others? Could you imagine how confused people would be? Whatever faults you might find with Pope Francis's response here, and believe me, I've found some criticisms to offer, and I've offered them here. But whatever faults you find with it, you can see how it's a far cry from the situation that we were originally being presented. And, and I think that's concerning, because if the Vatican had not come out, we would have a very different perspective, wouldn't we? Now, my question to you is, before we look at the rest of the questions, there's only two more. My question to you is, can you imagine how many other times we've only been given one side of the story? Now, in fairness, I think that the Vatican should be Johnny on the spot every single day. It seems they're finally learning in this pontificate, finally learning from the mistake of not answering some of the critics. I totally get not answering all the critics. I'm right there with you. But some of the critics need to be responded to. 
And some of the concerns need to be addressed. And the policy of not responding to them hasn't worked well for us in this pontificate. So finally, lately, we've actually been seeing, especially with Fernandez, we've now been seeing responses. Fernandez has always been coming out with responses every time an objection is raised. We're seeing a, a, a shift in this pontificate, and I welcome it. I'm glad. I'm so happy to see it because we've needed that for so long. We've needed the Vatican to come out and be Johnny on the spot and say, hey, here's the other side of the story. We've needed that for a while. We've had it, but not to the extent that we've needed it or that we're starting to see it now. And I, I welcome it. I hope we start to see it more. And I also hope that we start to see it more with stuff that's coming out of Germany. I'd like to see more responses from the Vatican. I would like for them to be Johnny on the spot about that as well. But can you imagine how many things we haven't heard the other side to the story from? Can you imagine how many times we've only been given one side of the story and how distorted our understanding of a, of a particular situation has been? It would have been like this would have been if the Vatican had not come out. So before we take a look at it, I'm going to step away here. We're right around the one minute mark. Uh, we'll take a two minute break and meet back in just a few moments and continue with the rest because uh, we're a little over halfway through, but we still got a little bit uh, a ways to go. So hang tight. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now. Hey everybody, I'm so excited to announce I have begun an Eastern Catholic podcast that is affiliated with God With Us Radio. God With Us Radio is part of an Eastern Catholic faith formation program put on by the Eastern Catholic Bishops of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And so God With Us Radio is putting out a lot of great catechetical material for Eastern Catholics so that people grow in their faith and they learn about the Eastern tradition in communion with Rome. And that's what I'm doing with this podcast affiliated with God With Us Radio. It is called Union Without Confusion. If you go to unionwithoutconfusion.com, you'll see a list of episodes. And you will also see a new episode at least once a week on Mondays at 5 p.m. Central. So I encourage you, go to unionwithoutconfusion.com to take a look at the podcast and enjoy great content that focuses on the Eastern tradition in communion with Rome. I hope you'll check out the website and be blessed by the material. Please pray for this new endeavor. We'll see you later. God bless. All right, we're going to continue here. I do want to remind y'all, hit that subscribe button. Help me grow this channel. A lot of people don't like what I've been saying. They've canceled me. They don't want to hear a word from me. They've stopped supporting me as subscribers and some as actual patrons because I have spoken in opposition to some of the extremes that we find in the church on the radical left and radical right, uh, what we would call radical progressivism and radical traditionalism. I've spoken against some of these things and I've really, you know, <laughs> ruffled some feathers. So if you want more people to see this video, Hit that subscribe button. Help me grow this channel so I can reach more people with the content that you appreciate here at RNC. All right, let's continue. We're going to continue now for question uh, four that the Cardinals presented in July uh, to the Pope that was, um, again, we just learned about this today. So here's the question. Question four. Uh, for dubium about pastors and theologians' support for the theory that the theology of the church has changed, and therefore that priestly ordination can be conferred on women. After the statements of some prelates, which have been uh, neither corrected nor retracted, according to which with Vatican II the theology of the church and the meaning of the Mass has changed, it is asked whether the dictum of the Second Vatican Council is still valid, that uh, the common priesthood of the faithful and the ministerial and hierarchical priesthood differ essentially and not only in degree uh, 
and that presbyters, by virtue of the sacred power of the order, that of offering sacrifice and forgiving of sins, act in the name and in the person of Christ, the mediator, through whom the spiritual sacrifice of the faithful is made perfect. It is furthermore asked whether these teachings of St. John Paul II's apostolic letter, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, which teaches as a uh, truth to be definitively held by the impossibility of conferring priestly ordination on women is still valid, so that this teaching is no longer subject to change, nor to the free discussion of pastors and theologians. That's the question that they ask. Here's how the cardinals presented the response in a very incomplete way. In the reformulated dubium, the cardinal said the Pope reiterated that ordinatio sacerdotalis is to be held definitively and that it is necessary to understand the priesthood not in terms of power, but in terms of service in order to understand correctly our Lord's decision to reserve holy orders to men only. But they took issue with his response that said the question can still be further explored. And by the way, notice the quote there. This is how CNA presented it. Quote, can still be further explored because if you look at the second dubia. The August dubia, that's what it says. The question can still be further explored. But that's actually not what Pope Francis said. He says something a little bit different. And it's actually important if they had quoted him directly and showed what he said and showed it in context, we would understand a little bit more. The problem is this is all they gave us. Now, could you imagine if the Vatican had not given us the response we're about to read, how much confusion there would be can still be further explored? So you're telling me women's ordination to the priesthood is up for grabs? That's all the cardinals were giving us. Fortunately, we got the fullness of the truth. Francis's actual answer to question four from Vatican website. The common priesthood of the faithful and the ministerial priesthood differ essentially. It is not convenient to maintain a difference of degree that implies considering the common priesthood of the faithful as something as secondary category or of lesser value. Both forms of priesthood enlighten and sustain each other. When St. John Paul II taught that the impossibility of conferring priestly ordination on women must be affirmed definitively, he was in no way disparaging women and giving supreme power to men. St. John Paul II also affirmed other things. For example, that when we speak of priestly power, we are in the realm of function, not dignity of holiness. These are words that we have not sufficiently embraced. He also clearly maintained that while the priest alone presides at the Eucharist, the task does not give rise to the superiority of one over the other. He also affirmed that if the priestly function is hierarchical, it should not be understood as a form of domination, but is totally ordered to the holiness of the members of Christ. If this is not understood and the practical consequences of these distinctions are not drawn, it will be difficult to accept that the priesthood is reserved only to men, and we will not be able to recognize the rights of women or the need for them to participate in various ways in the leadership of the church. And then the last paragraph of the response. On the other hand, to be rigorous, let us recognize that a clear and authoritative doctrine about the exact nature of a definitive statement has not yet been exhaustively developed. Now, notice he says exhaustively developed. He doesn't say reversed, but rather he says developed. And he also says exhaustively. That's important. He doesn't say reversed. He doesn't say contradicted. He says developed. Develop is not the same as contradicting or reversing, as we should know, development of doctrine. It is not a dogmatic definition, and that is true. Uh, what John Paul II offered in Ordinatio Sacerdotalis is to be held definitively. Is it, a, it is a what's called secondary object of infallibility because that is the language John Paul II used. He used it as a secondary object of infallibility rather than a primary object of infallibility. And since John Paul II did not speak of Ordinatio Sacerdotalis in his decision there as a primary object of infallibility. It is not a dogmatic definition. It is instead a definitive statement. And so it is not a dogmatic definition, and yet it must be adhered to by all. So all people who are saying, oh, we could completely dispense with it. No, it must be adhered to by all. No one can publicly contradict it, because they were asking about that as well. No one can publicly contradict it, and yet hasn't 
Father Reese been implying otherwise? And aren't there a whole group of other people that have been saying, hey, this is going to change? Pope, the Pope says no one can publicly contradict it. And yet it can be the subject of study, as in the case with the validity of ordinations in the Anglican communion. It could be a case of study in exhaustively developing it, but not as reversing it. You see the difference? Now, they presented it can still be further explored, is what they said. That's partially true in the sense that he's saying here, but not in the sense of reversing it. But isn't that how everybody would have understood the response if all we had were the Cardinal's representation of Pope Francis? They would have understood Pope Francis as saying, we can reverse women's ordination. We can reverse... Um, the sac sacramentality of the episcopate or the priesthood reserved for males alone. He doesn't say that. He says we can exhaustively develop this teaching in definitive statement. By the way, definitive means irreformable. So in other words, by recognizing it's definitive, Pope Francis is reasserting it will not be reversed. But it is true you could take definitive teachings and you can develop them and exhaustively explain them and in that sense, they could be a subject of study. Now, in fairness, Pope Francis could have done better here. Because though you have everything that's necessary to assure people that, no, we're not going to change this, it's there. Could he have unpacked that more? Could he have been more explicit? Could he have just said that explicitly? Yes, he could have. So, I think he could have done better in this paragraph. That being said, you can't reduce this paragraph to then mean, as any as some people might attempt to do, that he's saying now we can reverse this. Definitive statements can't be reversed because of the very fact it's definitive. Otherwise, you've made the word definitive nonsensical. So he already recognizes that. And he's speaking about developing it exhaustively and studying it as a case to, of study. It's not the same as reversing. There are numerous definitive teachings of the church that we have studied further and developed further. We don't reverse them. They haven't been contradicted, but they have been developed. I'll give you an example. However, this one does pertain to a primary object of infallibility, whereas here we're discussing a secondary object. Um, outside the church, there is no salvation. That has never been reversed, and it will not be reversed because that is a dogma. It cannot be reversed. However, have we exhaustively, not, not exhaustively, we haven't exhaustively understood it. Have we developed our understanding of it? Yes, absolutely. Of course we have. Read Lumen Gentium, paragraph 14 through 16, which summarizes the last 500 years of the development to that doctrine. Now, it's not a reversal, but it is a greater understanding of it. And that is what Pope Francis is saying here. He's not saying you can reverse the teaching, but you can have a greater development and understanding of it. Um, that being said, again, I think he could be stronger here. I think he could be more explicit. I think he could be more clear. But it's certainly there. Um, okay. Now, here is question number five from the Cardinals found on Burke's website. Uh, the fifth dubium about the statement, forgiveness is a human right and the Holy Father's insistence on the duty to absolve everyone and always so that the repent, so that repentance would not be necessary condition of sacramental absolution. This, this question was unnecessary as well. It's, it's like every one of these questions are unnecessary because they've already been answered by Pope Francis and the magisterium. Um, but Pope Francis has explicitly said that if anyone is in a state of mortal sin, they must go to confession first before, before receiving communion. He said that, by the way, after Amor Laetitia. So Amor Laetitia is not contradicting that proposition because he says it after that. In fact, I have a whole video on Amor Laetitia giving you the truth about it as well as the dubia that Cardinal Burke submitted in 2016. I encourage you to watch it. I'll put it in the show notes. But go and watch it if you're maybe confused about the situation. 
So this whole question was unnecessary because Pope Francis has already an answered it. That of course you have to have repentance. But he's going to answer it again. They continue, however, with the question. It is asked whether the teaching of the Council of Trent, according to which the contrition of the penitents, which consists in detesting the sin committed with the intention of sinning no more, is necessary for the validity of sacramental confession, is still in force, so that the priest must postpone absolution when it is clear that this condition is not fulfilled. I want to point something out to you. You probably, probably, I don't know how many other people are going to connect the dots, but I'm going to go ahead and connect it for you. This was the argument that Bishop Strickland and Bishop Schneider used to condemn Pope Francis's heresy whenever they accused it of heresy. When they accused it of heresy publicly in that act, they were doing so because Pope, they were saying Pope Francis was teaching a desiderio desideravi, that all you need is faith. You don't need repentance to receive the, the Eucharist. All you need is faith. And they were presenting it in the document as you don't need repentance. So they falsely accused the papacy and condemned it for heresy. When in fact, that's not the teaching of Pope Francis. And in this question, they're, they're asking what really those bishops were assuming whenever they condemned Pope Francis and spoke against his papacy in that way. So Pope Francis is going to answer this directly. So the answer he's about to give you specifically is a rebuke of Strickland, Bishop Strickland, Bishop Schneider, and everyone else who signed that document accusing the papacy of teaching heresy. It's a rebuke to them, and it it uh, explicitly shows that they were wrong to uh, to put this into doubt and to present this as heresy, even though Pope Francis had already addressed it elsewhere, as I've demonstrated. Okay, so follow what's going on. There's more than just the dubia question going on here. There's also that issue in the background. So the credibility of Strickland and Schneider really is at stake here. The cardinals, however, give their incomplete portrayal of Pope Francis's response to question five as follows. In their reformulated dubium, they note the Pope confirmed the teaching of the Council of Trent on this issue. So he confirmed Trent that absolution requires the sinner's repentance, which includes the resolve not to sin again. And you invited us not to doubt God's mercy. But then they're like, but wait, we're not putting God's mercy into doubt. So we want to ask more questions. Okay. That's all we got from him or from them. But he, in fact, gives us, as you know, more than that. So the Vatican gave us the rest of the story. Pope Francis says, repentance is necessary for the validity of sacramental absolution. Right there, Bishop Strickland and Bishop Schneider should publicly come out and retract their signatures on that document, accusing the papal magisterium of heresy because they have been corrected right here in that even though they've been corrected elsewhere they've been corrected here so i'm expecting and hoping and praying bishop schneider and bishop strickland will come out and publicly repudiate their signatures on a document publicly accusing the papacy of teaching heresy because he just completely repudiated what they attributed to him in that document because they attributed to him in that document saying in Desiderio Desideravi that all you need is faith to receive the Eucharist and they were interpreting that to mean you are going against Trent and you don't need to repent. And yet Pope Francis explicitly affirms the necessity of repentance and the Council of Trent. Repentance is necessary for the validity of sacramental absolution and implies the intention of not to sin. So there has to be an intention not to sin, what we would call a firm purpose of amendment. There is no mathematics here. And once again, I must remind you that the confessional is not a customs house. We are not owners, but humble stewards of the sacraments that nourish the faithful, because these gifts of the Lord, more than relics to be guarded, are aids of the Holy Spirit for people's lives. Can hear a pastor's heart here in the confessional, sorely needed, especially for people who are struggling with scrupulosity. There are many people, or there are many ways of expressing repentance. 
often in people who have a very wounded self-esteem to plead guilty is a cruel torture. But the mere fact of approaching confession is a symbolic expression of repentance and of seeking divine help. That's fair. I could see a situation where a person might have a real tough time, but by coming to the confession, they're expressing repentance. Okay, I can see that. I would take that if I were a confessor on a case-by-case -case basis. I wouldn't use that as a general rule, but Pope Francis doesn't either. But I'd take that on a case-by-case -case basis, especially if I know that a person is really struggling with scrupulosity. Oh, I could totally see that. Okay, but he continues. I would also like to recall that sometimes it is very difficult for us to make room in pastoral ministry for the unconditional love of God, but we must learn to do so. Following St. John Paul II, I maintain that we should not demand from the faithful too precise and sure resolutions of amendment, which in the end can end up being abstract and even egotistical, but that even the foreseeability of a new fall does not prejudge the authenticity of the resolution. And he's then referring to uh, John Paul II. Finally, it should be clear that all the conditions that are usually placed on confession are generally not applicable when the person is in a situation of agony or with a very limited mental and psychic capacities. So, very pastoral response that he offers here. I actually found it very helpful, especially as a person who used to struggle with scrupulosity. Very, very pastoral response. But he puts to bed and puts to rest the notion that, no, repentance isn't necessary or you don't need a firm purpose of amendment. No, he affirms that you need both of those. But the particular way in which that is expressed, repentance is expressed, and intention is manifested, that can vary according to a person's situation. Absolutely, of course. And it will vary according to each person, so you can't have a rigid way of determining that for every single person. You have to use a pastor's heart and discern those things individually with people. Is there really repentance here? Is there really an intention to change? You, you really have to discern that with various people. And I'll tell you, some people who just say the firm purpose of amendment prayer might not actually have a firm purpose of amendment, right? So just simply saying words isn't always the indicator. You have to be discerning. And that's effectively what he's getting at. So obviously a very uh, more complete response than what we got from the Cardinals, and that we would not have had if it were for only what the Cardinals gave us. Now, I want to give you some concluding thoughts after we've examined those, because the second dubium or dubia has not been answered yet, to our knowledge at least. It has not been answered yet, and I don't know if it's going to, because they're asking more questions, and when I started reading through them, I'm just thinking, you know, this has already been answered. Why, why do you keep trying to do this? And then pressing for a yes or no answer is obviously not adequate here whenever we're having to engage questions that involve a lot of distinctions and nuance. So that's unfair to put it in those terms. So I don't know if Pope Francis is going to answer the second one. I totally wouldn't blame him if he doesn't. But if he does, hey, great, and we'll read it together. Um. But I want to give you some concluding thoughts here. From what we've seen, I believe the Cardinals gave an incomplete and also in some cases, unfortunately, a distorted perception of what Pope Francis replied to them in private. Now, to be clear, I've already said it, but I'm going to say it again. I don't know their intentions. I don't know what their intentions were. I'm going to assume they did not have the intention of presenting a distorted understanding of Pope Francis. I'm going to assume that because I'm going to err on the side of charity rather than rash judgment. So I'm going to assume their intentions were good. So I am not putting into question the Cardinal's intentions in any of this. But what I'm saying is objectively speaking, regardless of whether the intentions are good or not, what they gave to us, in my opinion, was distorted. It was a distorted understanding of Pope Francis. It was incomplete, and it was distorted. And if the Vatican had not given us the full answer, all of us would have been unfortunately misled. Even if that wasn't their intention, we would have been misled. If the Vatican had not published it, we wouldn't have had the fullness of the truth here. 
Number two, the reasoning that the Cardinals originally gave for refusing to publish Pope Francis's response does not add up. So I'm not questioning their intentions, but I'm saying their answer does not add up. Now, you'll remember, yes, now Burke has posted Pope Francis's answer, but only after the Vatican posted it. And as I showed earlier in the stream today, they originally did not and were not going to give us the Pope's response, not the complete response. And so they were going to leave us in the dark. But the Vatican came through and gave us the full response. And so now they're posting the full response. Now they're updating their websites. Again, not questioning intentions, but I'm telling you how this is objectively and how this is, I would say, incomplete and distorted, regardless of intentions. And their answer for not originally wanting to publish the Pope's response until the Vatican came out and did it for them doesn't add up because if it's because it was a private correspondence between them and the Pope, then they should also refuse to share their own dubia to the Pope. So if you share one, you need to share the response, especially if you're sharing a response to the response. It's really obligatory on you to now share the whole thing. So it's, it's a take it or leave it thing. You either share the whole thing or nothing. But this reasoning for, well, I'm going to share my critique of the response, but I won't share the actual response. Could you imagine I got on YouTube and I did that to somebody who's, you know, an enemy of the Catholic Church and I refute a private email that they gave me, but I never show you the actual email. But I'm quoting from parts of the email, but I give you a distorted understanding and an incomplete understanding of it, but I'm publicly refuting it. You know, everyone would say, Michael, that was wrong for you to do. You need to publish that person's response if you're even going to take something that's private and make it public. That in and of itself can be put into question. Should you be taking something that's private and making it public? But since they already did that, well, you need to make their response public before you critique it because it's unfair to critique somebody in their private message without you quoting them in their entirety and in the context and without providing that. You see, it wouldn't slide for me. It wouldn't slide for anyone in a court of law. Could you imagine doing this to the accused? You accuse a person, and then you respond to their, their, their response to the accusation, but then you don't actually publish and make available to the court and the grand jury or the jury the actual response of the accused? Could you imagine? that This doesn't add up. The response they gave us does not add up. The Cardinals, however, cited Canon 212, paragraph 3, as the reason for revealing their dubia, per CNA and per the, dubia, the second dubia. Canon 212, or per Burke's website, I should say. But as Pedro Gabriel has noted about this earlier this morning, a good point about Canon 212, paragraph 3, is that's about expressing your opinion on an issue, not a dubia submitted to the Pope. And then certainly not in the case of, I'm going to critique the Pope's response, but then not give you his response. So yeah, Canon 212 doesn't work here. So that one failed. Plus, if they express their opinion on what the Pope said, they should also post the Pope's opinion on what he said to them. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say, well, it's fair to me to respond to this opinion, but then I'm not going to present what the Pope actually said. So the reasoning for this does not check out. It does not add up. And if the Vatican had not given us the fullness of the message that Pope Francis gave, we would not have had the full truth here. Also, I submit to you the Cardinals failed to account for Donum Veritatis in their behavior here. And multiple times, Donum Veritatis would seem to contradict what the Cardinals have done here. I'll read it to you. Quote, in cases like these, the theologian should avoid turning to mass media, but have recourse to the responsible authority. For it is not by seeking to exert the pressure of public opinion that one contributes to the clarification of doctrinal issues and renders servite uh, to the truth. So avoid going to mass media to put public pressure. And by the way, October 2nd is when this comes out. What happens in two days? 
October 4th is when the beginning of the Senate is. Coincidence? Or is this a poisoning of the well and using mass media to put pressure on the Pope? It's, it's really hard to avoid that coincidence there. We hear this has been going on since July, and we hear about a July and August dubia. dubia. We hear about them October 2nd, two days before the Synod. Is that maybe using mass media to put pressure on the magisterium contrary to Donum Veritatis? I don't know. Maybe they'll come out and explain and clarify. I'm certainly willing to hear the explanation. It also says, Dona Veritatis, this is authoritative, this is the magisterium, for a loyal spirit animated by the love for the church, such, as a, such a situation can certainly prove a difficult trial. That is, having to deal with some of these ambiguities. It can be a call to suffer for the truth in silence and prayer. So instead of resorting to mass media, once you've made your expressions or your concerns privately known to the magisterium, it might be difficult, but you might have to suffer in silence. That's the magisterium. That's not my opinion. That is the church's magisterial teaching here. In silence and in prayer, but with the certainty that if the truth really is at stake, it will ultimately prevail. So if really the truth is at stake, you might have to suffer in silence and prayer after you've made your concerns privately known to the magisterium. And you have to ultimately know that the truth will prevail, but you might have to suffer in silence. Is that the approach that the cardinals took here? Is that consistent with Donum Veritatis in the magisterium? I would love to hear a way to reconcile what the cardinals have done here and how that is not a violation of Donum Veritatis. It was a poor use of Canon 212, and it seems that it goes against Dona Veritatis. So I would say the facts suggest the Cardinals were going to leave us in the dark if it weren't for the Vatican's response. Only now are they publishing the Vatican's response. Earlier today, before the Vatican responded, as I've shown you screenshots, they didn't have the Vatican's response, and they weren't going to, according to their interview with CNA. And for a reason that doesn't add up and is inconsistent. And it seems to be in violation of Dona Veritatis. Make of that whatever you will. Now, I want to bring up Cardinal Burke's 2016 dubia, because the same thing happened in 2016. Pope Francis said he never actually saw the dubia in 2016 that was submitted to him by Cardinal Burke and a few other and a few others. He never actually saw it until he heard about it in the news. Pope Francis says, quote, or this is what the article says, quote, the Pope also commented on internal criticism of his papacy by conservatives led by American Cardinal Raymond Leo Burke. In 2016, Burke and three other cardinals issued a rare public challenge to Francis over some of his teachings in a major document on the family, accusing him of sowing disorientation and confusion on important for moral issues. Francis said he had heard about the Cardinal's letter criticizing him from the newspapers. So the place that Pope Francis learned about this dubia that was submitted to him was from the newspapers because the Cardinals put it in the mass media. So he didn't find out about this because he actually read the document. No, he found out about it because it was sent to the mass media. He says, this is a way of doing things that is, let's say, not ecclesial, but we all make mistakes. Well, did we just repeat that same mistake? I don't know. Did we? Think about it. It continues, he borrowed the analogy of a late Italian cardinal who likened the church to a flowering river with room for different views. We have to be respectful and tolerant. If someone is in river, let's move forward, he said, and so on. Anyways, you can go read the original article, but the point is appealing to mass media and seemingly putting pressure on the Pope where he finds out about this in the newspaper. Um, by the way, I did, again, a whole video responding to the 2016 dubia. Four of the questions were unnecessary. 
Uh, they had already been answered by Morsa Tizia. Only one of the questions was actually legitimate, and Pope Francis had already answered it elsewhere. So go and watch The Truth About a Morsa Tizia, which is a video I did here on the channel where I go over everything in a very in-depth presentation over the Amor Amorsa Tizia, the Dubia, and then further clarifications that were approved by the Magisterium on it. I go over all of it in detail. Go and check that out. Is history repeating itself? Was this another attempt to bring about the controversy that we found in 2016? Because I'll tell you, we haven't heard the end of that 2016 Dubia until today. Well, I mean, we still haven't heard the end of it. Were we about to see a new controversy by one of the same cardinals if the Vatican had not actually publicly responded? Is that what would have happened? I think it's a fair question to ask. Again, we haven't heard about any of this until today when the cardinals come forward with two dubia without the response of the pope two days before the synod. Two days. With mass media covering the issue. I also want to point out to something by Cardinal Fernandez that just came out. Same, I think same day, either today or yesterday. Just came out. He tells us not much new will come out of this year's synod. <laughs> I encourage you to go and read this Catholic News Agency article that speaks about it. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But he tells us not much new is going to come out of this year's synod. So those of, those of y'all who are expecting big changes, he says, you're going to be disappointed. And those of y'all who have big fears, he says, you also are going to, you know, not, not be disappointed. But uh, <laughs> in other words, your fears aren't going to come true. So go and check that out. Also, one of the in cardinals who signed this was Cardinal Seurat. And I found this quote from him really interesting. This is from the Catholic Register. This is a quote from Cardinal Seurat where he tells, tells us about opposing the Pope and warns us against it. He says, quote, The truth is that the church is represented on earth by the vicar of Christ, that is, by the Pope. And I have a whole video on, did Pope Francis reject that title? Sneak peek, the answer is no. That is uh, actually a lie. The truth is that the church is represented on earth by the vicar of Christ, that is, by the Pope. And whoever is against the Pope is ipso facto outside the church, the Cardinal said in an interview, October 7th. Uh, October 7th. Huh. That's an interesting comment. He says, whoever is against the Pope is ipso facto outside the church. The truth is the church is represented on earth by the Vicar of Christ, that is by the Pope. So one of the individuals who submitted this dubia says that as well. And I would just simply say, amen, Cardinal. Absolutely. Those who go against the Pope are ipso facto outside the church. Absolutely. I agree with that. I think we need to keep his words in mind. Also, one last thing. The same CNA article that spoke of this controversy today notes this about Pope Francis in relation to women's ordination. I thought this was interesting. On the possibility of the sacramental ordination of women. Pope Francis reaffirmed in 2016 the St. John Paul II's clear no via ordinatio sacerdotalis was the final word on the subject. Final word. Final means you can't reverse it because it's not final if you can. In 2018, then DDF Prefect Cardinal Ladaria confirmed that the male-only priesthood is definitive. Definitive is irreformable. Those are synonyms here. In a 2022 interview with America Magazine, Pope Francis again affirmed that women cannot enter ordained ministry and said that this should not be seen as a deprivation. I thought that was a good point that CNA brought up about Pope Francis and his views on women's ordination. Not only that, but also he puts in the can of law excommunicating anyone who attempts to ordain a woman and the person who attempts to be ordained automatically excommunicated yeah worth noting so those are my thoughts on the matter i hope this has helped avert a potential crisis that would have occurred for years now that the vatican has immediately come out with pope francis's response 
I hope that this also helps clarify some issues because as you can see, there's a lot going on, a lot of he said, she said kind of thing, <laughs> a lot of different documents all over the place. I gave you a timeline of events as they have transpired in the last day. And I've also given you the entire thing, the question, how they presented his response, the actual response. I'll put links to all this in the show notes, all these articles. I'm going to put all that in the show notes. If y'all want me to post this presentation that I've given y'all with the timeline and everything, I'll post it on reasonandtheology.com as an article within a few hours from now. I'll just uh, tweak it a little bit, post it as an article, and that will also be available to you. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. Hopefully this will help uh, people who are confused. Now, I know, I know the way things go with church politics. People are going to be confused for years from now. I mean, the whole Pachamama thing, that whole thing has been put to death. And yet, people are still confused about it to this day, even though it's been disproven. Everybody, the vast majority of people are still confused there. And so I can imagine, even though we're getting to see the full side of the, the other side of the story, the full picture, I bet there's still going to be a lot of people who are confused who only hear one side of the story. For that reason, please hit the subscribe button so that I can reach more people. If you subscribe, that will help the algorithm reach more people. Therefore, they will get to see this response, a full and complete response of this controversy that I can guarantee you we're not going to hear the end of for the next 10 years. We're still going to hear about this 10 years later. That's the way these things tend to work. So to help prevent some of that confusion before it happens, help me grow this channel so I can reach those people. And anybody that you know on social media that is sharing stuff about this, send this link to them. Or if you see them post it on Facebook or Twitter or TikTok, whatever, just post a link to this so that they can then see the response and they can have access to the entire story. Um, so I hope this was helpful. If it was, let me know about that in the comment section. Put it in the comment section. Let me know if it was. Um, and certainly, again, hit that subscribe button. If you want to support me financially and what I'm doing here, because this is my primary means of providing for my family. And again, a lot of people have just canceled me because they don't want to hear what I have to say. They don't like it because I tell them what they want, or what they need to hear rather than what they want to hear. Instead of tickling their ears, I tell them what they need to hear. It's, it's kind of like a guy who... You know, one guy wants to sell fast food and another guy wants to sell, you know, vegetables and broccoli or whatever. <laughs> people are going to go to the people with the fast food, right? They're, they're not going to go to a broccoli stand. <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm doing here. It's a broccoli stand. You might not like it, but you need it. You need to eat your greens, right? <laughs> you need your broccoli. <laughs> and so because a lot of people have just kind of canceled, they don't want to hear it, help me. Uh, reach more people by continuing to do this. If you want to do that, um, support me, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. I'll also post a uh, link there in the description to a GoFundMe and a PayPal if you would just rather use those platforms to support me. Please um, consider supporting me because, again, this is the way I provide for my family. And I would certainly appreciate it if I have the opportunity to continue to share this content with y'all. Uh, so certainly step up if you're able to. And if you're not, you know what? Just pray for me and pray for RT and what we're doing here and for the success of the ministry and for, you know, my salvation and the salvation of my family. And uh, so I would greatly appreciate that as well. All right. That's going to do it, y'all. We'll see you later. God bless. Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works with encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things? It's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course, Understanding the Magisterium, for more information. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.
Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.